This morning, thank you for honoring us with your presence. We do consider it an honor for you to be in this place, to be a part of what we are seeking to do in God's name. Likewise, for those of you who are worshiping with us online, thank you so much. I want to let you know if there's any way that we can help those uh, watching online or any of you to take the next step in your spiritual journey, we are eager to do so. That's what we are here for. John Wesley was a firm believer in the fact that conversion was a process. We don't just baptize people and then send them out and say, you're done now. No, Jesus' teachings over and over again refer to growth and seeds and plants and vines. In fact, that's the, reason, that's the theme of this season of kingdom tide. Um, you'll see the green. The green is a significant color which connotes the idea of growth and aliveness. Often you'll have the symbols of the wheat or the vines, uh, the grapes on the, uh, the vines, and that's what we want to be to you, a catalyst, a means by which we help you continue to grow as a disciple of His. If you're new among us, either the first or second or maybe even third or fourth time that you're with us, you could do us a favor by filling out the connection card, which is in the back of the pew in front of you. Um, it just gives us an idea of what your name is and maybe a phone number or email address at which we might, by which we might reach out to you and say, we noticed, we appreciate you being here and to encourage you along your way. Well, the big news this week, football's back, right? Ah, football's back. It's a big deal. And uh, I was just thinking that... Um, Everyone is at zero wins, zero losses when, this, when the season starts. And you have all of these fans showing up. Uh, they are hyped up. They are revved up. They are ready to go. They are filled with hope and anticipation. And uh, while I might not be able to um, replicate the moves or the cheers of the cheer squad, I hope you come with the same sort of anticipation for what might just happen while we're together. We trust in God's Holy Spirit being among us. Let us open ourselves to that promised spirit as we worship together. Welcome.
the unison prayer for this morning is printed in your order of worship. Will you join me? Let us pray together. God of welcome, you invite us to a banquet where the last may be first and the humble and the mighty trade places. Let us share your abundance with no fear of scarcity. Let us greet strangers as angels you have sent Send your spirit now so that we may find a place at your table and welcome others with radical hospitality. In the name of Jesus, guest at all our tables, we pray. Amen. And now, as those filled with the welcome of Christ, would you greet one another and pass the peace of Christ? The memorial candle burns today in memory of our friend and brother, Ralph Reynolds, whose passing was two years ago. Let us continue in worship as we pray together. O oh Lord, since we believe that you sent Jesus to be our teacher and example and savior, we pray this day that you would help him us to treat him as such. If he's to be our teacher, then we need to learn from him. I pray for the person who is trying to find time and discipline to develop a new habit of reading the scriptures or making time to learn from him in some other way. Oh Lord, if Jesus is our example, then let us dare to follow him. We pray for those who are searching for the courage to put his teaching into practice, especially when it means being out of step with others. If Jesus is to truly be our Savior, then save us, O God from our tendency to live in ways that are contrary to your will. Help us all to learn what it means to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that we might be saved from sins both great and small. We read the scriptures and notice the way that the religious folk of Jesus' day seemed to miss his message because they were so concerned with discussing doctrine that they failed to live by it. When the people of Jesus' day thought he wasn't proper enough and was welcoming and accepting the wrong class of people, he told about a single lost sheep. From a flock of 100 sheep that the shepherd cared about, and when that sheep wandered away, the shepherd went looking for that sheep. He taught about a selfish and self-centered son who used the inheritance he'd been given to live all kinds of wild and selfish ways, but whose father never stopped loving him and who, when the son returned, welcomed him back home with a party. Oh, Lord, as we learn these things and reflect upon them, 
Save us from those tendencies to judge and divide and ignore the needs of those who we might love and help in your name. May we always and ever remain aware that we ourselves are those you have loved and sought and accepted so that we might freely share that good news with others. We rejoice in the teachings and the example of our Savior Jesus and join together in praying together as he has taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Those of you who were a part of the church last fall and then especially this spring will remember that we held a capital campaign entitled A Place for All, a very fitting name for this campaign as we seek to make our church fully accessible. We don't have an elevator. We are way behind the times in terms of allowing accessibility into all areas of the church for those who may have one handicapping condition or another. We wanted to welcome different folks. Our um, modern worship service is growing by leaps and bounds. They're having to bring in chairs uh, each and every week, and so we're creating a modern worship space. We neglected the attention to our children's education area uh, for too long. Children and youth are so important and need to remain important. Well, you responded to our appeal for funds, but the campaign continues. I can tell you that the meetings have begun to actually iron out, to approve drawings, to design and implement the construction which will take place a little later, either this year or in the spring of next year. But here this morning to bring us up to date on how we're doing in terms of our funding uh, is Tim Walter. Tim, come on up. Good morning. Well, I am Tim Walter, and I'm here with you this morning on behalf of the REACH Committee to provide a pledge update for a Place for All campaign. Before I get to the pledge update, I would like to thank you for welcoming my wife and I and our family into your church four years ago. In my journey with Christ, I've been a member of many United Methodist churches, nine to be exact, and I have fond memories of those places as each one, in its own way, has deepened my faith and connection with God and Christ. I remember an experience from my Methodist confirmation process when my pastor taught us about early Christians having fellowship, prayer, and worship in secret places. One weekend night, our youth group reenacted those early Christian days and had our own secret service in the hidden place below the altar in the sanctuary. Moving quietly in the darkness of the church, we slipped into the sanctuary and located, through secret markings, the trap door and the floor of the altar. We entered into the dark space below, and with flashlights in hand, we read scripture and we prayed. And unlike the early Christians, our meal that we shared was popcorn and Coca-Cola. <laughs> Fast forward to today, and I'm witnessing the same experiences and spiritual growth in my family and our children from their connection with this church, a place for all, including us. Reflecting on those experiences, I came to the realization that our personal experiences and relationship with Christ in these places, both past and present, were made possible because of capital campaigns and gifts. And for those sacrifices, I am truly grateful. Those places like this one, the table is open, and fellowship with all Christian brothers and sisters is no longer in secret. Now concerning a place for all campaign, the REACH Committee is pleased to share with you this morning that to date the church has raised $1.1 million. We are currently at 34% of the amount of money pledged for a place for all in our three-year campaign. 
We are excited to report that 98 households uh, in our church have made a pledge to a Place for All campaign. And that 14 of those households have paid 100% of their entire pledge. Four households have paid 50% of their pledge. 31 households have paid a third of their entire pledge. Remember, these are people who are paying one third of their pledge each year of the three year campaign. One household has paid 25% of their pledge and 46 have made their initial payments and have begun to fund their pledge. Thank you for your time this morning. And remember, it's never late too late to pledge to this campaign. If you'd like to learn more about the Place for Campaign, a Place for All campaign, please let us know. We'd be happy to share additional details about our church's vision for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. And we are grateful that you and your beautiful family have found a home among us. Um, Hadn't planned to say this, but let me go ahead and say it, all right? For those of you who have not yet um, made a pledge to this campaign um, or are new to our church, I want to make sure that you understand that I hope every single person does for the following reason. I want all of us to be able to look upon the changes that are made and to see the new ministries that are begun and to be able to think to ourselves, I helped with that. Very important thing. After my mother died a few years ago, we sold the family farm and the house on that land where I grew up. Um, in the months afterwards, I being the executor for my mom's estate, had occasion to be in the city where I was raised up on a farm outside of Shawnee, Oklahoma. And whenever I was in town, I used to drive out to the farm and I would look. And sometimes I'd park in the long quarter mile driveway to the house and just kind of think and remember and reminisce. Uh, on a couple of occasions, I drove up to the house and met and walked around the place with the new owners. And uh, I remembered and recalled and gave thanks for that place. And, so many of the things that happened there. Now, it was just a house, just, just ground, 50 acres and a house. The house was made of ordinary materials, but it's what happened there that made it important. And that's the way our church is. Yes, the church is the people, wherever people are gathered in the name of Christ, but it's the building where so much happens. We want to treat this place and care for this place as if it is the very place that God dwells because, in a very real sense, that is exactly what it is. When you give, you help that conti to continue. I hope we will be generous and joyful in this opportunity to do so. Ushers, please come forward. Let's pray. Thank you for every occasion, O oh God, whether it's in the church or beyond the church, by which we have been formed into your disciples. We thank you for this place and the opportunity that we have, not only to continue our own growth as your disciples, but to include others and to make disciples in the name of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Grant that this would be our motivation in our giving now. Through Christ we pray. Amen.
let us unite in this historic affirmation of the Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Preparation is number 562 in your hymnals. Jesus, Lord, we look to thee. These are great words by Charles Wesley. Let's absorb these together as we sing. Please remain standing while we share this morning's scripture, which comes to us from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 14, verses 1 and 7 through 14. One Sabbath day, Jesus went to eat in the house of a well-known Pharisee. 
while he was there, he was being carefully watched. Jesus noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table. So he told them a story. He said, suppose someone invites you to a wedding feast. Do not take the place of honor. A person more important than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come to you. He will say, give this person your seat. Then you will be filled with shame. You will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place. Then your host will come over to you. He will say, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in front of all the other guests. All those who lift themselves up will be made humble, and those who make themselves humble will be lifted up. Then Jesus spoke to his host. Suppose you give a lunch or a dinner, he said. Do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, or your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you to eat with them, so you will be paid back. But when you give a banquet, invite those who are poor. Also invite those who can't see or walk. Then you will be blessed. Your guests can't pay you back. But you will be paid back when those who are right with God rise from the dead. May God bless the reading, hearing, and receiving of these words. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Do you know what an Amish barn raising is? The Amish are that Christian group that is known for their plain dress, with women always covering their heads, the men with beards, once they're married, they grow a beard, the broad-brimmed hats, and they are also, perhaps most known, for the fact that they do not use modern conveniences like automobiles or engines or motors or electricity or even zippers on their clothing. There is among the Amish even a more conservative sect called the Old Amish who do not even use buttons. Most of the Amish are farmers. A barn raising is when the Amish community comes together to help a member of their community to either build or repair a barn. The idea is that if everyone comes together and everyone shares in the work, no one person has to do too much. And it is amazing. Everyone comes together, there's work, the women are cooking, there's a break for lunch, they're socializing, and an entire barn, sometimes a very large, very complex barn is built in a single day. The understanding behind this practice is, you did this for me, I'll be there when it's time for me to do it for you. I recall my first impression when I heard about and learned about and actually saw film footage. This was back, I think, when I was in high school uh, about Amish barn raisings, and I saw one done on this footage. And I so clearly, still today, remember my reaction. The first reaction was, that's strange. And then I thought, but that's cool and right. And that's the way it should be. Here's a good phrase for us all. When the church and the people of God are at their best, it's the way things should be, the way God intended things to be. But in a day and time when people are guarded, suspicious, looking out for oneself, being guarded with our time and attention, not even knowing our neighbors, it can also be a strange thing to be the people of God living as God intended. I mean, think with me. People 
cooking food, and then taking it to someone that they hardly know simply because they heard or were informed that person is sick. I mean, friends, that's strange. People praying for people that they hardly know. People giving money, sometimes generous amounts, to a project in some place that they will never be for the benefit of people they will never see. I'm telling you, that is strange. People signing up. This happens in our church. When someone decides to become a part of our congregational care team, someone signing up to go meet and get to know and then continue to call on someone that they don't even know yet. Just a name on a page. But it's someone who is homebound. Someone who needs someone to check on them. People who go to gatherings and intentionally try and become friends with people who are different than them, different socioeconomic status, different skin color, different nationality, different language. It's strange, but it's also right. Somewhere deep down in our souls, we know it's right. One Sabbath day, a long time ago, Jesus was invited to a Sabbath dinner at the home of one of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the highly esteemed religious teachers and leaders of his day and time. The story says that the people who were there that day were watching Jesus carefully. Reverend Patricia Grace is rector of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Dalton, Georgia. And can't we just pause right now and say how awesome it is to have a name like Reverend Grace? That is, who wouldn't want to be a part of Reverend Grace's church? So she's got that going for her, right? Um, well, in reflecting upon this text, Reverend Grace points out that the text says that Jesus was watching them right back pretty carefully. She reminds us that the dinner parties of Jesus' day and time were more than just folks deciding to get together and have a meal. I actually have some friends that uh, we share a relationship with who occasionally, just a few weeks ago, called us up on a Wednesday and they said, we've got too much food, come and eat. And I thought, okay, we'll be right over, all right? That worked out well for us. Um, or they'll have an, a little, uh, half a dessert left and say, we, we've eaten what we're allowed to, come get the rest. Okay? But that wasn't the way, that, that wasn't the sort of gathering we're talking about. In Jesus' day and time, there was a prescribed etiquette that governed the serving of guests in the house. Meals were this way of observing and declaring and enforcing the strict social divisions of his day and time. Who was invited? where and with whom they sat, even the food that they got was the result of who they were esteemed or not esteemed to be. Who was somebody? Who was a nobody? And lest we think that this is something that only happened in the ancient world, my wife, Georgia, and I live in a grand, old house here in Waxahachie that has a toilet in the utility room. Why would there be a toilet in the utility room? And the answer is for the help. For the African-American employees or servants that were not allowed to use the bathrooms in the main part of the house. Reverend Grace reminds us that the guest list for these parties would have, would have included folks from various strata, socioeconomically speaking. Depending upon who you were, 
you were fed either a very fine meal, the best meal, or you were given just a small plate of a different sort of food. Yeah, a different menu. What did you get to drink? Well, if you were one of the important guests, you got the finest wine. If you were one of the less important guests, you were given something that tasted a little more like vinegar. Food and beverage was measured out like the host's friendship was and attention was in both quantity and quality. Now, you could also tell who was at the top of the heap by who got the best seats. They didn't have a lot of um, wooden furniture. What they had for these occasions were couches, sort of like long or elongated bean bags, if you will. And they were situated in concentric circles. The host was always at the center. And those who were most important got to sit close to the center. Those who were not as important were supposed to be on the outside, or maybe even forced to just wander around outside the tent or the home. The more important the guest, the closer he sat to the host. Now, when you showed up for one of these, there weren't place cards. You, it wasn't indicated uh, by your name being written somewhere where you should sit, so you kind of had to figure it out. And some folks knew where they should sit. But there was always the possibility, there was always the risk of being embarrassed. What if you sat too close to the center? If someone arrived a little late, and don't forget this is before folks had timepieces or watches or smartphones to tell them what time it was. If someone more important than you showed up a little late, you would not be asked. You would be told, you're going to have to move. So-and-so just arrived. Prospect of social disaster loomed when one went to one of these gatherings. And there, that day, Jesus did what Jesus so often did and continues to do. He started talking about being ways and doing things that those folks just were not accustomed to in the same way that he to us talks about being ways and doing things that we are not accustomed to. And they sure go against the way the world works. He says, look, when you go to a party like this, instead of being competitive for the most important seat, why don't you go to the worst seat, right? Stay humble. Um, if you go to the best seat, you might be told to move because someone more important than you. But if you go to the worst place, wouldn't it be great for some, the host to notice you and say, hey, come on up closer. There's someone special. I have long admired and am trying to become one of those people who seems to notice and tries to include people who are being left out. And I don't mean being shunned or rejected. I'm just telling you that in every group, almost every class, almost every party, there's someone sort of at the edges. Now, what I'm talking about is not trying to make someone who is naturally shy do something that is uncomfortable to them, not trying to force someone to talk if they don't feel like it. But in every group, there's always someone who's new, someone who is not familiar with the inside jokes and recollections and reminiscences that are sometimes being shared with those who are long, longer term and more familiar and more ingrained parts of the group. And I love those people who pay attention to those folks and try and draw them in. If you've ever seen the movie The Sandlot, it's how Benny treats Smalls. It's how Benny welcomes smalls onto the baseball team. And if you haven't seen The Sandlot, we got to talk, okay? you got to see that movie. I think my wife has probably seen it, I'm not exaggerating, 25 times. She loves it. It's a great film. Noticing, caring about, valuing, being interested in the other person. Isn't that what Jesus taught and lived? He said he came not to be served, but to serve. But then he gets even stranger. 
when he talks about strangers. He suggests, and I think I'm being faithful to the gist of his teachings, when I update what he said slightly, by implying that he said, how about inviting someone you don't even know, but whom you sense is having a hard time buying groceries? Someone who, as best you can tell, may be having a hard time paying the utility bill. How about, if you've got a swimming pool, and you're having a pool party, what about doing the absolutely weird thing of inviting someone in a wheelchair? They might not swim, but you never know. Here's one thing for sure. They probably don't get invited to a lot of pool parties. What about intentionally becoming the friend of the kid at school who doesn't have friends? You don't have to become their best friend, but stand with them, talk with them, include them. Thanksgiving's coming up in a couple of months. What about inviting someone who's alone? Maybe someone who's homebound, someone whose family doesn't come to visit. Yeah, yeah, it would be weird. But Jesus hung out with prostitutes and known sinners. Strange, but also right. In fact, Jesus seems to indicate the poorer, the better. Give to and include. Invite someone who cannot possibly pay you back, and you'll be repaid by God. I want to pause right here and, and speak for just a minute or two on this idea of being repaid by God. Okay? We were joking in staff meeting this week about Marisha Gary of our staff being rewarded in heaven with a big mansion on the hill. And Andy Truex would probably be her yard man or something like that. I think he took it well. We were just joking. But you know that some people think that's the way it works. I'm telling you as your pastor, beware of that. Think deeper than that. Don't buy into that. This idea of, I'm doing this good work so I'll have a bigger mansion in heaven. I'm doing this good work so I'll have more stars or jewels in my crown. I don't think that's the way it works. God gives something better, a righteous name, a righteous existence, eternal life. Now, don't forget we're talking about humility here, so you don't want to be too proud. But what could be better than the knowledge that you've been used by God to do God's will? I guess you can operate by a different sense of values to which we attach things like wealth or prominence or fame, but think through it. What could possibly be better than to be used by God to do God's will? What could be better than living in such a way that we actually become like Jesus, maybe even make a difference in the world? What could be better than engaging in habits over and over that resulted in us actually becoming humble? in actually developing the attitude that I'm no better than that person. I am willing to be as humble as it takes to love and be generous to that other person. There is an, there's a fascinating theme that is found throughout literature all across the world. It's found in the mythology of almost all civilizations and even religions. It's the idea of the king in disguise. Sometimes it's told, almost like the show Undercover Boss, where the king comes among the people to find out what they are really saying about him, to find out about their situation. And in many of these tellings and myths, the king usually finds out that they have troubles and pains and needs that he wasn't aware of. In other versions of the story, the king comes among the people to test 
the character of someone to see if not only are they a mighty warrior, but are they compassionate? To find out if the person is not only a good leader, but do they have integrity? How do they treat the stranger in need? Why is this theme all over the world? Here's why. Because we know in our souls that in caring for others, we care for God. In being kind to others, we are kind to the one who made them. Because we know that the one who looks different is also an expression of God's power and love and is a part of God's beloved creation. And did not Jesus tell the exact same story? When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him. Then he will sit upon the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick, or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them. Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Let me close with a prayer that I came across several years ago. It's been reposted many times. Chances are you've seen it online or posted on social media. I'm sorry that I cannot give credit to the person who originally wrote it. As I speak these words, you may seek to watch me read them, or you may seek to join in the prayer by bowing your heads and letting the words sink in, however you want to deal with it. The prayer goes like this. Heavenly Father, help us remember that the jerk who cut us off in traffic last night is a single mother who worked nine hours that day and was rushing home to cook dinner, help with homework, do the laundry, and spend a few precious moments with her children. Help us to remember that the pierced, tattooed, disinterested young man who can't make change correctly is a worried 19-year-old college student balancing his apprehension over final exams with his fear of not getting his student loans for next semester. Remind us, Lord, that the scary-looking bum begging for money in the same spot every day, who really ought to get a job, is a slave to addictions that we can only imagine in our worst nightmares. Help us remember that the old couple walking annoyingly slow through the store aisles and blocking other shoppers' progress are savoring this moment, knowing that based on the biopsy report she got back last week, this will be the last year that they go shopping together. Heavenly Father, remind us each day that of all the gifts you give us, the greatest gift is love. 
It is not enough to share that love with those we hold dear. Open our hearts, not only to those who are close to us, but to all humanity. Let us be slow to judgment and quick to forgiveness with patience, empathy, and love. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Tully. We talk about serving others and putting other people first. And one of the things that came to mind for me was the two weeks I spent at Philmont Scout Ranch in New Mexico. This was, this was a few years ago, like back when the Dallas Cowboys were still competing for Super Bowls, like that long ago, OK? Wow. Did that hurt a little? Sorry. And, you know, normally when you get a bunch of boys together and you go on a hike to the top of a mountain, it becomes a race. You want to see who's going to get to the top of the mountain first. But our trek leader gave us a couple items to sort of change the way we thought about hiking. Uh, one was this. If you ever take a break, you know, for water or to rest your legs when you're done with that break, instead of saying, is everyone ready? And of course, you'll hear everybody say yes. You might not hear that one person who says, no, I'm not ready. So instead, we would ask, is anyone not ready? The other thing that he wanted us to do was whoever was the slowest hiker that day, you would put him at the front to lead the group. And we did these things because we didn't want to leave anybody behind. We all wanted to get to the top of the mountain together. And we did. Our hymn of invitation this morning is Together We Serve. Let's stand and sing together. This place. What is our mission? To, to make, make disciples, disciples of Jesus, Jesus Christ for the, for the transformation, transformation of, of the world. world. I have three quick announcements for you here. The first is if you are somebody who wants to be a part of our security team on Sunday mornings, you're in luck. Kathy Grant will be out in the narthex with a sign up sheet. I encourage you to do that if you want to be a part. Second is this, WOW Sunday is coming up in three weeks, that's September 18th. We encourage you to sign up online, that's probably the best and the easiest way to do so, but if you're somebody who does need to do the paper way, we do have a form that was included with your bulletin. Read that, fill it out, and either put it in the basket for offering or hand it to one of the church staff members. Most important though is this, September 10th 
is Pancakes with the Pastors. That's at 9.30 a.m. It's incorrect in the bulletin. It says September 3rd. You don't want to show up on September 3rd. You want to be there when the pancakes are there. So September 10th, 9.30 a.m. This is for our kindergarten through fifth grade young people. I think that's all I have. Great. Thank you, Andy. Thank you to all of you for being a part of this service of worship. As we go forth from this place into the days that are ahead, here's what I'm hoping, that you and I would be given new eyes to see, new ears to hear, that we may notice the many, many, many opportunities for welcoming, loving, accepting, and including others. Go in the name and the spirit of Christ our Savior. Amen.